we turn this morning to Luke chapter 3. It uh, so happens that in our series that uh, we have uh, been working through in the book of Luke, that we come this morning to the account of Jesus' own baptism. And it seems a very fitting uh, text then to focus upon, uh, given the baptism which we've witnessed this morning. So we're going to be looking uh, at Luke chapter 3, uh, looking particularly at verses uh, 15 through 22. We'll begin our reading then with Luke chapter 3, verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord and give attention to it. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Is there anything more controversial, more uh, divisive in the church than the doctrine concerning holy baptism? <laughs> this is uh, something over which Christians have been fighting for hundreds of years, and I don't expect that by our consideration this morning that strife is going to cease. A and uh, yet there is a reason why this argumentation persists. There is a reason why this controversy persists. And it is simply this, that baptism is important. And because baptism is important, it is important for us then to understand what is actually going on on a morning like this morning when we have a young family standing up here and a precious young girl being baptized, receiving the waters of baptism on her head. What, what does this mean? And, and it's important as well, in connection, closely in connection with this, to avoid the superstitious use and understanding of what has taken place. And our text is particularly helpful in that regard this morning. It is helpful to to help us to distinguish between the sign and the thing itself. The sign and that which is actually being signified, that which is actually being taught or communicated when that sign is given. And uh, so this morning we focus on the theme of the Son's baptism. And we're going to look at two very different uh, aspects of the Son's baptism. We're going to be looking, first of all, at the baptism that the Son gives. The, the, the Son, as we read in uh, uh, verse 16, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to distinguish that from the sign itself. So, as we talk about the Son's baptism, we're going to speak first about the Son baptizing with the Spirit. But then secondly, we are going to witness and, and peer into the Son's reception of baptism. And we're going to see that He actually receives a double baptism 
according to our passage this morning. And what the, 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 the main idea that, that we see emerging from this text is that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, the Son of God, is anointed with the fullness of the Holy Spirit and in turn baptizes His people with that same Spirit. Jesus Christ is anointed with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The the fullness of the Holy Spirit rests upon Him and so then He baptizes His people with that same Spirit. So consider, first of all, the fact that the Son baptizes with the Spirit. Now, we had considered last Sunday evening the passage uh, just before the passage that we've read. We had considered the ministry of John and this baptism of repentance that he is giving. And and the the multitudes uh, from Judea are coming out to John to be baptized. And we saw that he preached a very sobering sermon uh, of the kingdom of of God being at hand and and what the implications of the coming of the king and of the coming of the kingdom were. And we we talked we 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 alluded to the fact that by the spirit's power working through his ministry John's ministry was successful and we see the success of that ministry very clearly in verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. You see what happened? God caused this special servant to be conceived and born. He commissioned this servant. And we said last week that that John serves as an ambassador. He serves as a herald, much like uh, uh, you can picture in in, uh, the medieval times how kings and, and, and other nobles' royalty Wherever they went, they would be received with the blasting of trumpets and and with the the unfurling of their colors, their flags, their insignia. Well, in the same way, Jesus, the King, the Messiah, the one on whom God's people had waited for so long, He is announced with a herald, and that herald is John. And the message received an audience. The people heard what John was saying. The people understood what John was saying. And it created a fresh sense of expectancy within their hearts so that they were waiting expectantly. And in fact, as they they looked upon John, though John was a very unlikely candidate, though John was a wild man, so to speak, he was a man from the desert, he was a man from the wilderness, very, very unlike the king that they were expecting His ministry was so powerfully attested by the Holy Spirit that the people were wondering in their hearts, is this actually the Christ? Is is He, in fact, the King for whom we are waiting? Now, Now, John, unlike many of us, maybe our natural inclination, doesn't want to allow that that kind of thinking to persist for even a moment, and he steps in and he clears that that thinking up and he says, no, 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 no. And then he wants to make a distinction. He goes on to make a distinction between himself and the Christ. He makes a distinction, first of all, in, in terms of excellency. In terms of magnificence. It's it's not a comparison between the sun and the moon, but the comparison between the sun and a candle. He says, do not misunderstand me. I'm just a candle. Just a flickering light in the darkness. But the sun of righteousness is coming. And, and, And the difference between him and myself is inconceivably great. The difference between him and myself is such that I'm not even unworthy to unlatch his sandal. I'm not even I'm not worthy to be his servant. And not just any servant, 
but the, 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 the lowest servant in the household hierarchy. The one who, when the master comes in with his feet sweaty and dirty from the road and, and from spending all day out and about town, gets down on his knees and takes the sandals off his master's feet. He says, I'm not even worthy to remove my master's sandal from his dirty foot. That's how much greater. How, how much more excellent. How much more powerful. How much more worthy this one who's coming, who is coming is. He says there's a, there's a, a night and day difference between the excellence of our person, between our personal magnitude, between the, the power that I have and the power that he has. And that's, that's really the second difference that he makes. The difference isn't simply the difference uh, between uh, the lowest of human beings and the greatest man ever to live. But the difference is one of power and of, of kind. You see, John's ministry, though indeed it, went, it proceeded in the power of the Holy Spirit, though indeed it was, he, was, he had a megachurch, so to speak, in the, out, out you know, by the Jordan, right? The people are flocking out of the towns and the cities. They're coming even from, from great distances in order to hear him preach. And when they hear him preach, they are cut to the heart. And, and they are convicted of their sin. They are convicted of their need. They're convicted of their unworthiness of the coming king. And as a manifestation of that, they are receiving the waters of baptism. And really, what, what do the waters of baptism say more clearly than anything else? Don't they say, I'm dirty. And I need to be washed. We grapple with that a little bit, don't we? So we have this beautiful baby girl. She's even dressed in white. And yet the very act which we have just witnessed is a message shouting loud and clear, she is dirty and she needs to be washed. That's what we've witnessed this morning. And that's what the people that were coming out to John were saying as they received the waters of a baptism unto repentance. We have sinned. We have sinned and we need to be cleansed. And now John says, make no mistake, the one that is coming is so much more powerful than I am. For, for first of all, he is the, the same one whose power is behind my own ministry. It is... His Spirit which has driven my own ministry. But make no mistake, John is saying, I can preach ever so loud. I can preach ever so clearly. You can feel ever so bad and ever so rotten and, and ever so needy under my preaching, but there is something that my preaching cannot do. There is something that my baptism cannot do. And it is this, it cannot change your hearts. Your hearts need to be changed. That's what the waters say. But you need someone greater than me to do that. He says, this one who is coming, this one whose sandal, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And what John does, to, does here is he draws together the dual nature of Jesus' ministry. What does it mean to be baptized with the Spirit and with fire? Well, we might, we might immediately think of what happened on Pentecost. As, as the, the uh, disciples are gathered, as the tongues of fire are resting upon them, and as they're speaking in tongues, and as the word of Christ goes forth and it cuts to the heart and the people are wounded and they cry out, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And that is one aspect of this baptism of spirit and fire that John is referring to here. Uh, in, in Malachi chapter 3, 
the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah is compared to a refiner's fire. Now, what does a refiner's fire do? Okay, A refiner's fire is for precious metals, right? We don't think about this so much anymore because this is something that kind of goes on behind the scenes. Yet it was a very common illustration and idea at, at that time. The idea that, that you pulled crude metals from the earth. You pulled silver or gold or, or bronze uh, from the, or brass from the earth and you, it had to be purified because it was bound up with all kinds of, of junk, right? It doesn't come out beautiful. It doesn't come out gloriously sparkly. It comes out all mixed and, and, and flecked. And you put it into the furnace, and the furnace burns away the impurities. And what comes out is pure. It's beautiful. It's precious. And he's saying, this is the the baptism that the Son gives. It's a baptism of purification. What, What we witnessed here this morning is indeed a significant act. It's it's not a sentimental act. But it is something that is real. It is the, the, the reality, the surety of the Gospel message being confirmed in our sight again. That just as surely as water washes away the filth of the body, so also Christ is able and willing to wash away the filth of all those who come to Him. And John is saying, I am just entrusted with the sign. But this One who is coming, He is able to do, uh, perform the reality which is signified in baptism. But then, He, he goes on, to to, uh, clearly communicate the fact that this baptism of fire has a sharp edge to it. Because this baptism of fire that, that Christ brings is one of judgment. It's one of judgment. You see, what happens if you put an, something that doesn't have any precious metal in it, so to speak, into the furnace? What, what happens if you put a straw bale into the furnace? How much gold or how much silver comes forth out of that straw bale? And I, I hope that even the young, the young uh, kids among us know, know enough to say <laughs> that thing's gone. There is nothing at all that is left. And that is what, what John is communicating. He's saying this baptism of fire is a baptism of purification for those who indeed have faith in Christ. But it's a baptism of judgment for those who do not grab hold of the promises that are signified in baptism. For those who do not have those promises applied to their heart. For those whose hearts are not cut open and purified, they are being judged even by the act of baptism. You see, baptism... Christian baptism is a very, very heavy weight to go to hell with. Have you ever thought about that? Christian baptism is a very, very heavy weight with which to descend into hell. Because those who have tasted of the gift, because those who have sat under the Gospel ministry, Because those who have been catechized and trained in the Scriptures, those who have heard of Christ, those who have have had revealed to them the ministry of Christ, they receive that much heavier condemnation. And, And John says, this is a terrifying prospect because this one who is coming after me, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor. He's got this grain and he's got this chaff. He's got this big fork and he's throwing the, this, this mixture up into the air. And as he throws it up into the air, the wind blows and takes the chaff away, that which is light, that which is un- insubstantial, that which is meaningless, and the grain falls back down to the floor. 
You see, it's, it, it's not just that He has the power to purify. He has the power and the authority. He is invested with the authority of Almighty God to judge. It is His threshing floor. Did you catch that? It is His threshing floor that He gathers or, or clears. It is His barn into which the wheat is gathered. This one is far mightier than John. John's baptism was a baptism of preparation, but Jesus is a baptism of consummation. Jesus' baptism, the baptism of the Spirit that He brings, which by the way is not to be confused, there's a great deal of confusion here, with a second baptism or, or, or an added gift of the Spirit that is received at some point later in your Christian life. This baptism is one and the same with the new birth in Christ Jesus, okay? So, you either receive it or you don't. If you receive it, you are united to Christ through it, possessing true faith. If you do not receive it, you have nothing. He says, Jesus comes to bring the baptism to which my baptism only points. And this is our prayer, is it not? Not only for, for Ember, but for all of the children of this church and the young people who have been baptized. This is, this is our prayer for the many prodigals who have turned away from this congregation over the years. Dozens of them, I'm sure of it. Dozens who are walking in the way of the world. Dozens who have effectually rejected the promises of God in Christ Jesus testified at their baptism. This is our prayer for them. That the Lord would break them. That the Lord would bring this baptism of purification. That the Lord would, would gather them to Himself. So then, this brings us very clearly to the question, how do you think about your baptism? Presumably, most people sitting in this room are baptized. Whether you were baptized as an infant, or whether you were baptized as an adult, or somewhere in between, what do you think? How, how do you think about your baptism? And how do you think about the baptism of your children? Do you look at it as, as some kind of a, a, a mark, like a good luck charm? Because it's not. It's not. It's a testimony of the reality testified to in the Gospel everywhere. And the pressing need is for us and for our children to be regenerated and sanctified by the baptism of Jesus Christ. But notice, notice uh, secondly, in this connection, that this is good news. People look at the ministry of John, and uh, they, they think John was harsh. John, John gets a bad rap, but look at what Luke says in verse 18. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news, the gospel to them. Now, some people tell me from time to time, Pastor, you don't preach the good news enough. You preach judgment too much. My dear brothers and sisters, I preach judgment because it is the truth of God. And I preach the truth concerning judgment because that is part of the good news. You see, the human heart needs to be humbled before God. The human heart needs to perceive its need. Such was the ministry of John. But now look at John's reward. Verse 19, But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch, because of Herodias, he had taken his brother's, uh, his, his brother's wife, had divorced his brother Philip, and then married him. When he rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Now, there's two things that, are, that Luke is doing here. First of all, John is being moved out of the way, so to speak, because the son is stepping onto the scene. John's ministry of preparation is, is being wrapped up for Luke and set off to the side because from here on out in the book of Luke, the focus will be 100% upon Jesus, the Son of God. And, and so though... Uh, Jesus, there is a, approximately a year after Jesus' baptism to the time that, Her, uh, or that John is imprisoned. For Luke, 
as a literary convention, he's moving John off to the side and he's saying, look, 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 he's here. The king is here. Jesus is here. Rejoice, he has come. But secondly, note in this connection, the the fact that John's reward for being such a faithful servant is imprisonment. And, and then eventually he's beheaded, right? And, and this, has to, th- th- this has to challenge us where we're at because we hate suffering, okay? And, and especially if, if there's ever been a generation that hates suffering, it's my generation, the generations that follow. Every generation hates suffering even more because we have been coddled in the lap of luxury. And uh, I, I see some older heads nodding and saying, you don't know what it was like. When, <laughs> when I was a kid, I walked, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's true, right? We have been coddled in the lap of luxury. So even the slightest bit of suffering, we turn away from it, we're deathly afraid of it, and yet what what Luke is communicating is that the lot of faithful gospel servants will in fact be suffering. Because a servant is not greater than his master. And just as as Jesus himself will first appear to great acclaim, and then he will be crucified in an act of humiliating shame, so his servant and his herald, his ambassador John, will suffer for the sake of the gospel too. Sometimes we say, well, you know, I don't share the gospel very much because I don't know that it would be received very well. You're right. You're right. Because for every one that receives it, there will be several that reject it. And for every one that says, thank you for, for being so bold to speak to me, there will be at least one who say, get out of my face. And, and it, it only gets worse from there. You see, John suffers for his testimony to the Son. Uh, but we, we've seen then that, that the Son uh, baptizes with the Spirit. But secondly then, consider the fact that the Son himself receives a double baptism. In verse 21, we read this, this major understatement. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Now, Luke doesn't place a lot of emphasis on this because Luke really wants what happens next to stand out loud and clear to us. And yet, how are we to understand this? That Jesus himself, the perfect Son of God, the one in whom there is no spot or blemish, is receiving a baptism of repentance. Does he need to have his sins washed away? And if not, then why why is he receiving the waters of baptism? We see already in his first public manifestation that Jesus comes along with his neighbors. There's nothing distinctive about him to his neighbors. They, They don't realize that he's walking in their midst. They don't realize that as they stand in line, each to receive baptism, that the Son of God, their very Messiah, is standing in their midst. And how appalling that he would receive the waters of baptism. And yet how fitting. Because already here he begins to identify with us, his people. You see, Jesus' life was a life of continual humiliation. It was a life of continually undergoing things that he did not deserve or that he did not need in order to take those in order to represent and and to, to suffer and to die for and to redeem those who did deserve judgment, who did need to have their sins washed away. And yet here is the humility of our Savior. He receives the waters of baptism you, you can picture these waters as, as literally loaded down with, or, or, or as figuratively loaded down with sins. <laughs> the sins of the people are, are being washed into the water, okay? And Jesus is receiving this, this dirty sin water basically dumped on him. 
And, and one commentator says, I consider this incident Jesus' first miracle. The miracle of his humility. The first thing Jesus does for the human race is to go down with it into the deep waters of repentance and baptism. And Jesus' whole life will be like this. It is well known, catch this, it is well known that Jesus ends his ministry on a cross between two thieves. It deserves to be well known that Jesus begins his ministry in a river among sinners. Here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In every way, human. In every way, like us. Sin accepted. And yet identifying with us in our humiliation. Identifying with us in our sinfulness. Identifying with us in our brokenness that He might be the sin-bearer and that He might take away our sins as He suffers upon that tree. And this should cause us to marvel. This should cause us to, to worship. This should cause us to, to be amazed and to be filled with joy this morning that Jesus stepped so very, very, very low in order to bring us up that He sunk down into the waters of baptism, later down into the grave, in order that He might be raised up and with Him, that we might be raised in Him. So He identifies with His people in baptism. But then secondly, we see that He receives an entirely different kind of baptism in verse 22. Uh, we read, And the Holy Spirit descended on Him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. How are we to make sense of, of what's going on here? There are so many points at, at which our ideas of the Trinity falter when faced with the ministry of Jesus. There are mysteries here that we cannot explain. And, and so we might ask, how is this one who is indeed fully God and man, yet needing to be baptized or anointed with the Holy Spirit from heaven? And yet this is something to which the Old Testament Scriptures testified again and again. That the one who was coming, that the King upon whom they were waiting, that the Deliverer for whom they were waiting, that He would come bearing in Himself or being baptized or anointed with the fullness of the Spirit. Uh, take, for example, Isaiah 11. And I'm not going to try to steal Dan's thunder here, okay? Because in God's providence, Dan's going to give us uh, God's Word from Isaiah 11 tonight. But just to, to get you thinking, Isaiah 11, chapter, or chapter or verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon Him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Here in his, in his public manifestation, immediately following his baptism of repentance, we find him praying. And as he prays, the heavens are opened and the Spirit descends from heaven. Now, we should not picture a bird because that's not what is said here, okay? But that the, there was some kind of a physical appearance that came down upon him like a dove, in the manner of a dove, not an actual uh, dove. That's not what Luke is, is communicating here, so we don't want to, to get sidetracked. But at the beginning of his public ministry, then, there also comes this affirmation of God's pleasure with the Son. The Spirit Himself and the anointing of the Spirit manifests that He is God's chosen one. That He is God's anointed. That He is the one that God has set apart for this task. And then this voice to, to, to nail it down you are my Son, whom I love. 
with you I am well pleased. The waiting of God's people has come to an end. The king for whom they've been looking is here. The redeemer, the the deliverer who they so desperately need is on the scene. And God affirms this from heaven. Leaving no uncertainty. God affirms that he is well pleased with Jesus. And this is vitally important for you and I. How many of you struggle with guilt this morning? Or uh, better, uh, shame? How many of you struggle with ghosts of sin's past? How many of you are struggling with sin today? And because you're struggling, you seriously doubt God's reception of you today. You see, for the one who believes in Christ, there can be no doubt. Or there ought to be no doubt, is rather the way that I should put it. There ought to be no doubt. And why is that? Because if you are in Christ Jesus, if you have come to Him, if you have grabbed hold of Him, if your faith is secure in Him, it is not you that is being evaluated by the Heavenly Father. It is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is you. This is what the Father sees for all those who are in Christ Jesus today. And then by extension, for all those in Christ Jesus today, you have this word. You are my son. You are my daughter whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Do you see that this is the glory? This is the pinnacle? This is the center of the Gospel? That this is the message that God's Word is concerned to communicate to us? If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. But if you are in Christ, you are also justified by Christ. He stands in your place. His righteousness given in the place of your sins He takes away your sins and nails them to that bloody tree. And so then the only question today, the question that this leaves us with at the end of this is, am I in Christ? Am I grabbing hold of Christ? Am I seeking refuge behind Christ? To, 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 try, to try and, 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 and to crawl into Him in the sense of a refuge. This is the, the image, the metaphor that the psalmist uses again and again. My God is a refuge. He's a covering. If you are in Christ, God is well pleased with you, dear brother, dear sister, today. If you are not in Christ, today is the day of salvation. Today, the wrath of God yet waits. Today, the mercy of God calls you unto repentance and faith in the Son of God. In the One with whom the Father is well pleased. This is what the baptism, the baptismal waters testify to. You need to be washed. And the promise is held out that Jesus washes all sinners who come to Him. And that's that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Son. There's no one like Jesus. Jesus, we confess that we love You. We thank You that You are our righteousness. That with You, the Father is well pleased and that we who are in You have been received as sons and daughters. Confirm this Word to every doubting heart today, we pray. 
continue to draw unto Yourself those who are yet outside of Christ. And Lord, we pray that each one of us would know the power of Your baptism of purification. For we ask it in Your name and for the sake of Your glory. Amen.